As you well know, it's not a church service. We are not a church. We don't beat to the churches. We don't march to the churches to beat to the church's drums. We are here because of our personal interest in the Word of God. You are interested in knowing what this book says. If you have any other interest, it will not be fulfilled here. It is not our purpose to try to develop a church, congregation, or a meeting here. I have never done that anywhere, not even in Los Angeles, where I have taught the Word for 30 years. But our purpose is to study the Word of God. The name of the work is the Word of Truth Ministry. You cannot join it. You can be a part of it, as you are by even being present here. The name of the work is the Word of Truth Ministry. And it's a kind of a mom and pop thing because Mrs. Sellers and I, uh, we do most of the work. Yet I would have to give credit to the hundreds of people who share in this by circulating our literature, by supporting the ministry, uh, oftentimes doing the work that uh, uh, makes up this work of the Word of Truth ministry. Uh, the work is all done by means of uh, the producing and the circulation of Bible study leaflets. Some of them are back there on the table. They're free. Uh, I should have said the production and the circulation of free Bible study leaflets. I do not know how many that we have circulated in the five years that I've been trying to take my understanding of the Word of God and put it in these five page leaflets, and these four page leaflets. <laughs> but uh, 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 it is enormous. We printed 300,000 this summer. Uh, that's quite an undertaking. Uh, we also work by means of radio. And uh, we have at the present time uh, five stations. I'll be on the air here this afternoon at 4.30 on station WWDJ. I got it right, didn't I? <laughs> uh, good. A little bit. My heckler's down here in the front row. You know. <laughs> so, uh, I got it right. WWDJ. Well, I've only been on that now for about 12 or 13 weeks. It's a new ministry, but the Lord willing, I'd like to stay on it for a couple of years. It's an expensive ministry. I undertook it because I just felt the pressure of the Lord. I just felt the great desire within my heart to do it. I didn't want to take on any more work. Uh, but I did take it on, and I'm very, very glad that I did. And uh, we do not use this time to raise any money. We do not use it to sell any books. Uh, we do not use it to plug anything. We do announce that we have the literature because we'd like to minister people by means of the written ministry. And if your name is not on our mailing list, then we would uh, very much like for you to give it to us and we will put your name on the mailing list. And if you want a full set of the 100 issues, well, you'll have to pay the postage. That way, postage will be to you $2. You'll see when you get it, it's $2.22. Uh, but... Uh, We'll send you the 95 issues right away, and you'll get five more late in November or about the 1st of December when we have our regular mail. So uh, uh, we're charging you nothing at all but just the postage. And that is the 100 issues of Seed and Bread, wherein I've tried to take the cream, shall I say, of my understanding of the Word of God and put it into these four-page leaflets. Now, uh, we also work by means of the tape-recorded ministry. We have a cassette uh, ministry. We've got, I think, 390 titles, 380 titles. Uh, just expositions of the Word of God, simple expositions, and so on, plain expositions of the truth. And you can get these for $1 per cassette. Each cassette contains two messages, each one about 42 minutes in length. I have about 400 outlets. In other words, I minister to uh, 400 couples or maybe classes. These are even used in groups where they'll play a tape and discuss it. So that is our tape-recorded ministry. 
And then, of course, beyond that, I make these conference tours quite twice a year, in which I stop at uh, half a dozen places, New York being one of them now, and uh, I talk over the things of the Word of God uh, uh, to the people. As I told you this morning, it cost us now about $100,000 each year just to carry on this ministry. And that, of course, is provided by the friends of the ministry. There is no rich person behind this. There is no one at all who's making gifts to cover up any deficit or anything like that. The people give, we go as far as we can go. We pay for our radio five weeks in advance. WWDJ is now paid up for the five weeks. Hey, I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> they were checking me. It's now paid up. Mrs. Elder said, I sent the checks today. So they'll be paid up for five weeks in advance. And when we can't pay in advance, we're going to quit. Because I don't want to get in debt. Uh, I don't want to embarrass myself or the ministry or anything else. I just know it's time to give up. And uh, so uh, that is the same way with all the other work that we do. But through the years, the Lord has always provided. He still provides today. Now, while I uh, do, as I, the scripture says, that they that preach the gospel shall live by the gospel, I do not live uh, by this work. I uh, have means, no great amount, but I have sufficient means that I could live without this work. But since the workman is worthy of his power, it is no great thing if I do make a salary uh, from doing this work. Anything at all that you give here in the offerings, anything you give to me, any payments you make for uh, the bound volume of these leaflets, it all goes into the treasury of the Word of Truth ministry. You could write a check to me, and that check would be to Otis Q. Sellers. I would endorse it right over, pay to the order of the Word of Truth Ministry. In fact, I got a little rubber stamp with which I do that. I'd rather you make checks payable to the Word of Truth Ministry, but we'll endorse them over if you do otherwise. So uh, I do not come here to take an offering for anything at all but the work. These hotels are rather expensive, uh, and uh, you might well know it. A room like this cost us $60 per day, uh, this room. And that means that for the four meetings, that's $240. And, of course, I have a sleeping room up on the fifth floor of the other building so that I'm in the same room. And this is the most expensive meeting that we have. So I thank you for your support in making the ministry possible in this place. I'll tell you those facts because uh, you're a part of it. You're a part of the work. You're praying for it. You're giving to it. Uh, you're... Uh, thinking of me, you want the work to go on, and uh, it is going on. So uh, I give thanks to all of those that have a part in making it possible. My dear wife would send greetings to every one of you. Some of you know her personally and have met her, and uh, she is a lovely person, very gracious lady, and in my eyes a very beautiful woman. And uh, so... Uh, she looks after the work while I'm gone. She used to travel with me, but it took 10 weeks then to make the conference tour. I had to carry clothing for three seasons. <laughs> and start out in the summer, hit fall about Michigan, hit uh, winter up at Buffalo. <laughs> and snow as we cross over Canada come down into New York. We slipped all the way down here in the ice sometimes as we try to get to Philadelphia. And so on. Then you hit summer again as you go back into the south. So the trip got so exceedingly hard that she, both on her and on me, she said, you take the plane, I'll stay at home, I'll look after the work, and uh, just make it as short as you possibly can. And uh, so uh, that's why that she is not with me, but she does send greetings and her love to every one of you, whom she has come to know, of course, by seeing your names uh, uh, on the uh, mailing list, and, uh, on your gifts, your checks, and so on. And uh, we appreciate your help. Of course, I would not forget to uh, thank uh, publicly our my beloved brother there, Gabe Monheim, whom we referred to in the last issue of uh, uh, our bulletin as our man in New York. And not that we own him or anything like that, but he is our man over here. We're behind him. And uh, it isn't that we're supporting him. He's helping us. Uh, but uh, we would if we needed to, he knows that, he can look to us for help if he needs it, 
but he is uh, so much with us over here. While he does a different work than I do, I wouldn't try to be Gabe, and if Gabe would try to be me, he'd make a big mistake. Uh, there's only room on this earth for one each of us. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but I do want to thank Gabe for his very, very warm fellowship, and the better I get to know him, of course, the uh, more I like him. Many things I can tell you about him, but uh, we just keep those uh, quiet for the time, for the time being. <laughs> so uh, that's everything by way of promotion and by way of announcement. We'll get into the studies that bring us together. Uh, the word episkopos in the Greek means an overwatcher based upon epi, which means over or on, and scope, you know, a scope is a telescope, is when you're looking from a distance, but this is kind of overlooking. It isn't overseeing like a slave overseer, but it's just watching over the welfare of believers and the souls of men. Uh, Titus tells us if any man desires the work, it's not the office, there's no office, uh, of an overwatcher, he desires a good work. And my purpose in making contact with possible people as far as possible, that uh, within the limits of my ability and knowledge to watch over their souls, their spirits, their minds, just as much as I possibly can. Now, uh, that's going to lead me to deal with different things this afternoon. Maybe I haven't done this before, but I might even be jumping from one subject to another. Uh, lately, I have noticed, last year, two, three, I have noticed, that literally, not hundreds, but thousands of books have been published which are uh, trying, attempting to establish in the minds of men uh, the uh, Calvinistic doctrine of election and predestination. A great many books are written that would tell you not only this doctrine of election and predestination, but that God is superintending all things. Uh, I had a leaflet that Brother Gabe gave me that was written by a man in Pasadena who says that God is superintending everything that is going on on this earth. And he said, I'll give you an example of this. And here was his example. The example was that uh, his office manager, it's a religious work uh, called a biblical, biblical research something or other, but his office manager uh, was coming down the street about 30 miles an hour on a motorcycle and a car quickly pulled out of a driveway and he had to veer and skid which took a lot of skin off his legs and so on but he was not badly hurt and he says that's because God was superintending it all and saw to it that he was not badly hurt well of course I think if I were God I would see to it that the accident never even came close I would have stopped him back to some traffic light so that this car could have got out of the driveway, even though the man at the driveway should not come out so fast. But you just can't say that God superintended this. Now, when you see a policeman down here superintending traffic, uh, what kind of a superintendent would he be if he allowed uh, close accidents to uh, come up, but not a bad accident? You'd fire him right away and say, get him off the force. So I have made a study of these things. There are people who just speak out of their great ignorance and it's just the ignorance of the world, and they'll tell us that God knows everything. And that since God knows where I will be tomorrow, I've got to be there. And that God knows when I'm going to die, so if tomorrow's the day, I've got to die. I can't die next week, I can't live for another year, can't make it back to Los Angeles, I've got to die tomorrow because God knows it, nothing can foul up his knowledge. Now that's what we are told. This is just, I think, the reasoning of men, uh, but uh, it is based upon the uh, very much upon some of the ideas that were put forth that came out of the Reformation, uh, part of Reformed theology, and so on, that, uh, uh, well, they will quote the Scripture to prove it, and the Scripture they will quote to prove it is that God works all according to his own will, uh, that God is operating everything according to his own will. Now, they back off a little bit when they come to sin, uh, to iniquity, to crimes, murders, rapes, fornication. They'll back off a little bit on that. 
But if you're going to say that God's superintending everything that takes place, where do you back down? Because you know that the greater part of things in this life today are made up just of evil. You know that. And if God is only looking after the good things, He isn't looking after much because there's not a great deal of good things. Uh, to tell the truth about it, I'm not a pessimist, but open up your own news. Well, you don't have newspapers here. This little town has no newspapers. And, uh, but open up your newspapers any day and you will quickly see that evil is predominant. Uh, in the business world, it's just about to break the business world. There's so much embezzlement and stealing. You know, it's how it is in the uh, social world. You know how it is in the world of entertainment, all of these things. It's God, the superintendent of all of this. They say he's allowing it. Well, anything at all that I allow that I can stop, I'm responsible for it. You know that. I've got to take the responsibility. If I allow it to happen and I can stop it, I'm, I've got to take the responsibility for it. Because uh, if I should see a four-year-old with a loaded gun aimed at someone, and I did not go up and grab it out of the hand of the four-year-old, and uh, uh, fix his own would not fire, certainly I would be, in some measure, I'd always have to feel responsible for that person's death. If I had the power to stop it, I think with the four-year-old, as old as I am, I still have that power to take the gun away from the four-year-old. So if I knew all the facts and saw this about to happen, allowed it to happen, certainly I would be guilty of that murder myself, to a certain extent. All right? Now, uh, as I say, these books are being published, and one writer that you will find is a man named Arthur W. Pink. Uh, I happen to know Arthur W. Pink, and uh, in the days of his, uh, when he was on this earth, and his days of his ministry, and I knew quite a bit about him. I one time had all of his writings, and I remember well that Arthur Pink said that uh, he was speaking this night, I believe, in... Uh, in Brisbane, Brisbane, Australia, am I right? No, wait, well, anyway, it was in Australia. That's New Zealand, isn't it? Yeah. Sydney. He was speaking in Sydney, Australia. Because you said that in one of your books. All right, then. Yeah, I did say it in the book. He was speaking. He said, uh, nothing ever happens except as God planned. He said, God planned that I should be here this night, and even planned the very words that I should say to you. Glad that you should be here in these seats listening to me tonight. This is all according to the plan of God. And yet, if he just have thought, he knew that there were Catholic meetings going on, and the priest must have been up there saying things that were put in his mouth by God. Is God responsible for all of this? What about this? Now, now let's just take this matter of the knowledge of God. I say that God knows what he wants to know, and you cannot force knowledge on him. God can either pay no attention to a thing or else give attention. See, even I don't have to know all the iniquity that's going on in the world. I'm glad that I don't. And since God's the pure eyes that behold iniquity, if God is looking upon all the pornography and all the fornication, all the iniquities going on even in New York, that's what his life is filled with and his mind is filled with. You see, that's what it would be. He's doing nothing about it if he's looking upon it. So God... Uh, to know what he wants to know because he's God. So when the time came that men said we've got to have some religion in our life and they got to a place where they finally began to build the Tower of Babel, then the Lord came down to see the tower that the children of men had built. And when he saw the tower, then he uh, dispersed them and uh, confused their tongues. Uh, but he waited for a certain time. And if you'll read the story of Abraham uh, and Lot, and you'll read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that uh, it was so bad there that uh, Abraham couldn't even find ten men that were righteous in Sodom. But here's what the Lord said. The, the cry of its iniquity has come to my ears. And I've come down to see if the iniquity is greater than his cry. If it is, I'll deal with it. And God dealt with it because it was. So God can take knowledge at any time, you see. God doesn't need to pay any attention to a man's life from the day of his birth till the day of his death. And yet in a split second, he can bring that whole life before him and see the whole thing, take it all in. Now look at this, 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 through 75 years. But look at it all, because there's no past with God, no present with God, no future with God. Of course, there are things in our lives that come up that God cannot ignore. Remember that. There are things in our life that take place that God 
God can ignore it. Might be, now I'm not saying sin now or iniquity. God can bring that before him at a later time. See it all in a split second and make his judgment. What I'm telling you is this, that when a sparrow falls, God knows it because it, his, its life goes back to him. See, that sparrow has life. And life comes from God. When life goes back to God that gave it, and he knows the sparrow that falls. But here is the thing. It's not that he set the date on that. The sparrow should fall on that date and had to fall, but because its life goes back to him. Then he said, of course, you're more valued than many sparrows. But how much is a sparrow worth? Don't get to think yourself big because God said you're more valued than many sparrows. What's a sparrow worth? One sparrow. Uh, now, uh, but not to dwell there too long as I want to move on to this matter of the Calvinistic doctrine of election. Well, I remember when I was just a young Christian, I was very much disturbed by a man who came to me, made the statements uh, that uh, uh, that only those that God elected to be saved, chose to be saved, would be saved. All others would be lost, therefore they were predestined for eternal conscious torment, and so on. And uh, the passage he quoted was this, that we're chosen in him. Now, this is the way he said it, chosen in him before the creation of the world. I didn't know enough scripture then to know that he was quoting that wrong. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, a few other passages. And I said to him then, I said to myself, well, I can't make a decision on this. I wish I'd known then the verse of the Bible says, he that believeth shall not make haste. For I believe anything, I'm not going to make haste in doing it. I, time will come and I'll be able to study this out, and I will study it out. So the time came that I did study it out. And even the time came when I wanted to become familiar with the Calvinistic doctrine of predestination and election. And I uh, looked at the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3. Uh, and I condensed it, and I think this is an honest summary of the Calvinistic theory of election, of election, as it is defined in the third chapter of the Westminster Faith. It says that, get it, a certain number of men, now I quote, are by the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, quote, predestinated unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. The particular individuals thus predestinated and foreordained are unchangeably determined, and their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. The decree of God that some shall be saved does not rest on any foresight of their faith. The decree of God that others should be lost does not rest upon any foresight of their unbelief. I believe I've condensed it honestly. And that is the Calvinistic theory or doctrine of election as set forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, in the Bible we have three words. We have the word eklegomai, that's the verb, eklektos, which is an adjective but it uses a noun, and uh, we have the word uh, ekloge. E-K-L-O-G-E, -E, which is a noun. Now, those are the three words. These words, if you would trace them out to the New Testament, you would find that they occur 51 times. 51 times. And that in these 51 occurrences, uh, out of these 51 occurrences, that 29 times they are translated by some form of the word choose like choose or chosen or choose it and so on. Uh, that's the way they're translated. The word elect or election. Well, where it seemed like it might help their doctrine of election, they put elect or election in. Where it might expose it, they left it out because the translators of the King James Version were devout, earnest followers of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Reformed Theology that came out of the Reformation. Everything that Calvin wrote, he wrote it before he was 21 years of age, never changed the line after that. He made no progress. 
never change the thing. I'm not saying that just to criticize Calvin. Uh, the situation he came out of, it could be that way. Now, in this doctrine of election, uh, uh, if you would look at it, uh, I'll give you some references to turn to. Let's take the one in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse 13, where they translated it. In the uh, uh, King James Version, they translated it by the word show. And this is Luke, chapter 6 and verse 13. I'm not going to pull any tricks on you with the Greek. I'm not using the Greek to show off. I'm using the Greek to get out of the truth, get at the truth. And in Luke chapter six and verse thirteen, we read that. I'll take twelve to make the connection. It came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. Continued all night in prayer to God. Verse 13. When it was day, he called unto him his disciples. He called unto him his disciples that were many in number. And of them he chose twelve. Elected twelve. That's the Greek word, eklegomai. Uh, the verb, it's an action. He elected twelve, whom he also named apostles. And right here, this tells you the meaning of the word elect. It means exactly the same as when we say we elected a governor. What did we do? We chose one man from the citizenry. He has to be a citizen of this state. We chose one man to do a certain work and to fill a special office. And all elections take place in a man's lifetime, every one of them, and it always has to do with someone already related to God, never has to do with the forgiveness of sins, never has to do with the uh, salvation of a sinner, never has to do with eternal condemnation, it always has to do with the place of spatial service that a man is chosen for. All of these he called were disciples. They were learners who were being taught by him. He called them to himself. Then out of them he elected twelve. What for? To be saved? No. Uh, he chose these twelve that he named apostles. And in another passage it says that uh, uh, out of them he chose twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them forth as heralds to preach. So election always has to do with the service that one performs. And it takes place in his uh, lifetime. Now, if you would turn on, since we're right here, we'll take Luke 10. And I'll do this just to keep the verses in order. In Luke 10, it speaks about uh, Martha and Mary. And uh, uh, verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen, same word, elected that good part. To elect is to choose. That's what the word means. She's chosen that good part that's not going to be taken from her. And what was the part that she chose? Not the busy service of getting things ready for the Lord to eat, but while sitting at his feet to learn of his word. And uh, may you choose that part. You can elect a part, and may you choose that better part. Uh, not serving at tables, but that part is to sit at his feet and to learn his word. That was Mary's choice. Let's go out here and take another one in Luke 23, 35. Luke 23 and verse 35. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen, that's the elect of God. And he was the elect of God. For if we would turn to Peter, we would find out that Jesus Christ was God's elect to perform a certain service. To perform a certain service. To be the Messiah. 
They said, if you are the Messiah, the elect of God, then come down the cross. Well, he didn't, but uh, he was the elect of God. It has nothing to do with the salvation of a sinner, nothing to do with the redemption of the lost, nothing to do with justification or forgiveness. It has to do with the service of the office that a man holds, or rather the office he holds, which indicates the service that he performs. Let's take another. In order, John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 7. John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 7. Jesus answered and said, Have not I chosen you twelve? And that's the word eklegamai, the verb. Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is the devil. Therefore Judas was one of the elect. It has nothing to do with the salvation or forgiveness. This is a man lost. Better for him if he'd never been born. Well, no, it, it means more. Yes, it's better. You can take a generator, but he would generate a pair, certainly a pair. Oh, John 6, verse 7. John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 70. Oh, what's the matter here? <laughs> Look again. No, 6, verse 70. 7 0. 7 0. You know what it is? But anyone gives a passage or calls a hymn and this has 70 he ought to say 7 -0. because people hear the first part and don't hear the last part but I forget to do it it is John 6 7 -0. 7 he said I'm not I chosen and that's the word elect no other word I've chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil but he was elected to be an apostle. He was one of the twelve. He kept company with Christ. It shows you it has nothing to do with the salvation of a sin. Well, let's go on here now and take another one in its order. I'm going to have to hurry. I don't want to spend the whole day on this. Let's go to 1 Timothy 5.21. Way up to Timothy 5.21. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Here's there, elect angels. Would be the chosen angels, angels chosen for special service. Some are not chosen for special service, but they're angels nevertheless. He charges him before the elect angels. I do not know too much about the verse. I'm just showing you that angels are elect. It has nothing to do with salvation, forgiveness, or redemption. Now, uh, uh, another passage we might look at is uh, in the... Uh, uh, let me see. What will I take? Oh, 1 Peter 2 now. Let's take uh, several here in Peter. 1 Peter 1, 2. 1 Peter 1, 2. Now let's get the introduction. It says James. Oh, I got I got James. Peter. Peter, apostle of Jesus Christ, to the it says strangers, but they're not strangers. They're trying to make Gentiles out of them. These are the sojourners of the dispersion, the dispersed Israelites <laughs> that were scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. They were Israelites. And if there was any people that were the chosen people, the elect people, it's a people called Israel. They fill the spatial place. They're going to fill a very spatial place in the future. They're elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He knew what he was doing. It was all a part of his plan. That's why he chose it. Now, if you go on beyond that to uh, 
Uh, let's see. The next one we'll take is Second uh, Peter, verse 4. Second Peter, verse 4. It's speaking of Jesus Christ. Uh, to whom coming is unto a living stone... Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, that's the word eklektos, chosen of God and precious. That's 2.4. In 2.6 you'll find it again. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, I lay in Zion a cheap cornerstone, elect, precious, he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Chosen to be the same. Chosen to be the Lamb of God. Chosen to die in our place. Certainly he was the elect. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 he says, To these believers, you are an elect generation. You're an elect kind, really, is what he means. A royal priesthood, a holy nation... A peculiar, a peculiar treasure uh, that you should show forth the praises of him who calls you out of darkness unto his own marvelous light and that's what they were chosen for and their destiny is that in the future when they serve the Lord they will uh, show forth the excellencies not the praises but the excellencies of him that calls you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Well, there is one I'll call your attention to in uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. He says, uh, <coughs> These shall make war with the Lamb, they and shall overcome them, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he, the Lamb, is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with him are called and elected, chosen, and faithful. Three things. Called, that's position. Elected, and they're faithful. Three things. Now, therefore, when you read in Scripture, and this is found in Matthew 20, 16, repeated in 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. When you get to the next Democratic Convention, there'll be quite a few who will have their names in as candidates. They are positioned as Candidates seeking the nomination. See, uh, you have to get your name in, and you're a candidate. Now, out of those who are positioned, that the delegates will vote on, only one will be chosen to be the candidate. And out of the two or three candidates, whoever they might be, sometimes there's a group of them, only one can be the president. You see, that doesn't mean that we shoot the other one. <laughs> Or burn him in the furnace. No, we just he just passed aside. He go on, maybe be elected later, who knows? Therefore, when a man is elected president, we call him president elect until he is inaugurated. But he's elected until he's inaugurated. But election doesn't make him a citizen. <coughs> See? I won't give him citizenship. And election never gives anyone a place in the family of God. Not in the least. But election might give him a place of special service. Now, anyone can take the entire 51 uh, passport. You see, where do I find it? Look at the Englishman's Greek concordance. Look up the words choose, chosen, or elect. Find the list of Greek words. They'll all be there close together. And you can find every one of the 51 occurrences of these three words. They're all related. They're all related. Just one is the verb. The other is the adjective that's used like the noun, and the other is the noun. But you'll have everything before you, and when you get through, you will be able to say that in no passage in the New Testament 
Does the election have anything to do with the salvation of the sin? Don't worry about it. But you say, Mr. Sellers, you, you certainly gave it a fast shuffle there and passed over that verse in Ephesians. No, I wasn't given it a fast shuffle. I'm going to deal with that now as the final word, Ephesians. Chapter 1. Ephesians, chapter 1. In Ephesians 1, it says, Paul addresses this to the believers in Christ Jesus. He couldn't have said faithful in Christ Jesus. It not just for faithful, it's for the believers in Christ Jesus. Uh, then he says uh, in verse 3, and I'd like to give this a little clear rending, exalt. You see, Ulego is to speak well of, but when you speak well of a person, you exalt it. Exalted be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has exalted us in every spiritual exaltation, you see, among the most exalted in Christ according as he has chosen or elected he has elected us in him before the founding not foundation it's the found see it's right out of the verb and it comes to us like we'd say run and run it is based upon the word that means found before the founding of the world. Now, this world needs to be worked on until it is ready for the kingdom of God. And before God establishes the world of the future, the world to come, before he founds it, we have been elected, we believers, in our life, based upon our faith in Jesus Christ in this difficult time when it's so hard to believe. We have been elected that we should be hallowed, means marked out for special service, and without offense before Him, in love, having predetermined us, not predestinated. Predestinated means your destiny is settled in advance. This doesn't have to do with destiny. It has to do with predetermination. And God has predetermined the present day believer for the sun place. That the adoption of children is just one word in the Greek. And it would mean the giving someone the place of a son. And he has predetermined us who now believe for the sun place through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, and this is all to the praise, that's the extolling of the glory of his grace, wherein he graces us, has made us accepted, this grace does make us acceptable, but he graces us in the beloved. And even here, this choice is that we should be holy. And holy means marked out, hallowed for special service. When we say, hallowed be thy name, keep it that way. Don't mix it up with a thousand and one things. And uh, he's predetermined us for the sun place. When God sets up his kingdom on this earth, I will not be a commoner. You will not be a commoner. You will be among the nobility. A son of God to do the great work of extolling praising if you want it that way that's a little weak I like extolling the glories of this grace that he showed to mankind in the dispensation of the grace of God and that's election and that's predestination now I'd better stop there for questions uh what question would you like to ask? What uh, would you like for me to say first? When, when the covering 
I do not know. God hasn't given us a detailed blueprint. He's just given us a very small Bible. And when the tabernacle of God is with man, what the service of angels will be, because this doesn't deal with angels. This deals with the human race. Now, angels are only mentioned, and so are demons as they come in contact with man. Or in some way, try to frustrate the work of God, and then they might be mentioned. But we know very little about them, and we're satisfied to have it that way, because that must have been God's will. We don't know what the future of angels will be, what place they will fill, but it does tell us that even in the kingdom that man will judge angels. And so uh, I wouldn't want to be an angel if there's any higher place. Not that I'm overly ambitious, but I want God's best. God's very best. Yes. That. So, could you comment on Ephesians 1 and 11? Yes. All right. There is a Greek word, top hunter. It's an idiom. It is the word... When we say, I would like that, all that means is, I would like it very much. We would. Either she or I, but we can't afford it. So we just say, I would like that. And it came out of a minister who came into our home when we were first married. Mr. Summers has a good sense of decoration. Our home looked very nice, hard new furniture. This young minister came in, got a beautiful home, nice furniture, all in good taste, but he said, Ida wouldn't like this. And she likes big old things, and so on. Well, we hadn't met Ida, but one day he brought her to our house, and he said, Think this furniture's nice, Ida? He said, I sure do. You wouldn't like this, so would you? She said, I, I think I would. <laughs> he said, no, I think you wouldn't like this. You like big old antiques. She said, I'd sure like it if we could afford it. <laughs> and that was why I, he said, I would, I wouldn't like this. They just couldn't afford it. Well, uh, so we just say that now when we can't afford a thing. We would very much like to have. We just blame it on the island and say, I wouldn't like it. All right. Uh, Mr. Sells, do you think, think that that doctrine of cephalopsarian Calvinism or infralopsarian Calvinism causes a lot of people uh, like to get uh, so upset that they can get mentally ill or they oh, yes, get yeah. into hell? Or, oh, I, I know that. I know that to be a fact. I've seen it. Uh -huh. I've seen okay. it. I've had reformed ministers tell me that. Uh -huh. uh, actually, about it. It's now tap back to your question. Yeah, 11, it says, yeah. in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predetermined according to the purpose of him to work at all things. Right. We've obtained this portion in Christ, and it has been determined in advance what our portion will be as believers. See, we get this portion as believers, for this is for believers. It's part of the glory of belief. And uh, he has predetermined this in advance. Uh, it's all been determined in advance that we are to be the sons of God, and as sons of God to extol the glories of his grace. I knew an actress, Hollywood actress, and I knew her publicity man. And his one great desire was uh, that uh, to get her name before the public and extol her. And he heard someone say that he, he has a magazine. Boy, did he come up to me fast when he heard that. He thought he could get her name in my magazine, but he couldn't. He couldn't at all. Uh, he spent his whole time extolling the beauties and the graces of this woman. He never said anything bad about her, no, because he was paid for saying things good. Well, we don't have to be paid for saying things good about God, but all right now I want to extol the glories of his grace as much as I can, uh, but then he will grace me for it, and I'll do it. Now, this matter, he works all things. That's just top potter, which means he works all these, all these according to his own way. Now, let me go on. I want to talk to you a moment about principles of interpretation. Certain principles that we follow, not that men lay down in seminaries, but we find in the Word of God. And I've had to give names to these principles of interpretation that I follow. Uh, and the names seem like they're a little bit crude. 
but they don't quite fit, but that's the best that I can do. Now, there is a passage in the book of Romans, turn back to Romans if you will, and in chapter 4, chapter 4, it says, verse 17, it speaks there of God who quickens the dead. Chapter 4 of Romans, verse 17, the last part of it. God quickens the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. He calls the things which be not as though they were. And I call that the, the are but not principle. Let me see if I can make that a little clear. It's a strange thing, but i got to give it a name. And this is the R. I'll that in quotes. But not. And I'll write out. And quite Well, that's pretty good. Well, yeah, I got a principle. They are, but not principle. And you find this all the way through Scripture. And this principle is simply this, that many times in the Bible, that you are going to find things which would be spoken as if they were true to their fullest extent now, but they're not. And the illustration was this, that God spoke of Abraham's seed when he had no seed. Now, he did it. You know he did. Abraham had, as would say, neither chick nor child. But God spoke of his descendants, his offspring, as if he had them. They weren't, but he spoke of them. And that's the principle right here, you see. Uh, that's the, the principle, that God spoke of them. And, and since God spoke of them, they had to be. God knew they would be, and he could speak of them as if they were. So he spoke of Abraham's seed when Abraham had no seed. That's the not but our principle. Now, if you would go back with me to the Psalms, and you would read in the Psalms, uh, I'm working here a little bit from memory, but I can turn right to it. Uh, let's take Psalm here, oh, let's start with 95. 96, Psalm 96. It says here, uh, Verse 10. Say among the nations that Jehovah reigns. And the Hebrew would say that Jehovah has become king. The world also shall be established. That's that founding of the world that spoke of in Ephesians. And we are elected before he found. You know, uh, when we elect a president, we elect him to take a place in an order that's already established. Don't upset the order, but take your place in the order that's established. See? Don't take powers that the Constitution didn't give you. Use the powers. But God chose us before he founds his order so that we might fill a place in that order. Before he establishes his own system that we might fill our place in that system. And so here it says, The world also shall be established, and it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people's righteousness. But this is a case of God calling the things that are not as if they were. Then when you come to the 97th verse, the 97th Psalm, pardon me, and the first verse it says, Jehovah has become king. That's the Hebrew. I'm not kidding you. That's what it says. Uh, well, to reign, you have to become king. That Jehovah has become king. You see, he's assumed sovereignty. He's taken to himself his great power, and he's governed. Jehovah's become king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitudes of the isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. Where do you see that today? The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. The hills are 
the little nations, but they melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Don't say anything like that today. But it's God calling the things that are not as if they were. Psalm 98. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Who's going to write? Wait till the kingdom. Maybe that will be your job to write that some of those songs. You see, when God governs, we're going to have to have a new literature, a new music. Oh, how we need a new music. <laughs> we're going to have to have a, uh, well, anything that expresses the people. You know how the literature and song and drama, maybe even the dance for all I know. Don't object to that in the least. But all of these things will be expressing a people. Now, when you hear this awful, raucous sound that put forth his music, that just shows the conditions of the minds and the spirit and the souls of men. And, oh, wait till the time when we can sing unto the Lord this new song. Why? Because he has done marvelous things. His right hand, his great skill, and his holy arm, his great strength has gotten him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness, what is right in his sight. He has openly showed this in the sight of the nations so that every nation will know what God requires, what God demands, what they'll have to do to exist as a nation. He has remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth, meaning the people living in the most remote places, have seen the salvation of our God. They've seen it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. And then he speaks of the instruments. Uh, verse 7 says, Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth. To judge the earth means to govern. He's going to do it with righteousness shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity. And so in all of these things like this, always ask the question, does this come under the principle of God speaking of the things that are not as if they were? Now, today if I had eternal life, I wouldn't die. But I've got God's word for it, and that's as good as half. Some men's word is as good as their bond. God's word is better than so all I need is God's word for it that I have the gift of eternal life whether I hold it in my hand or have it in my possession or not makes no difference I've got God's word for it and God calls the things that are not as if they are alright now next principle I want to set forth is easily named I call it the prayer prophecy principle the prayer prophecy principle that every prayer in scripture recorded by the spirit will be answered and answered to the letter it actually becomes a prophecy. When he taught his disciples to pray, uh, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It will be. It's not today, but it will be. We try to hallow it, but most men don't. They just bring the name of God into everything. Their little works, their little ambitions, their little schemes, their big schemes. Yes. As one radio preacher says, God said to me, you build this hospital. I said, God, I can't do that. I'm not big enough to do that. You do it, God said. I had to do it. I said, take the name of God in vain. It's an empty thing. So, uh, and uh, uh, now, this prayer prophecy principle. Thy kingdom come. It will come. What does kingdom mean? Govern. Men are afraid to study this word. You remember in the days of Emil Zoli? Zola? Have I got it right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Jacques was a, I accuse. I accuse men of not daring to look at this word king. They want to make it to be something inside of us based upon what the Lord said to the wicked Pharisees. The kingdom of God is within you. What the Lord was telling them is that when this government comes, it's not going to be outside of men and be following them around. It's going to be inside of them. 
and you violate one of its precepts, one of its known laws, and it'll deal with you then and there. It doesn't have to bring you into court with witnesses and evidence and all of this stuff. No, sir, when the kingdom of God comes, it'll be within every man. Like the law of gravitation, which works within me. Like the law of electricity, which works just as much in me as on the outside. It is all in me and in you. So this law of government, this divine government, comes within every man to bless, yes, and to curse. For when God makes his judgments, that very government will cost, take some man's life in the day when the soul is sinned, it shall die because the kingdom is within me. I was in a bank up in uh, Northern California and it was so guarded with bulletproof glass and everything that uh, it would be almost impossible to get the robbery, make a robbery there. And uh, the banker, the president of the bank, was a friend of mine, he was showing me through. And uh, don't think because I say he's a friend that he's the fellow that supports the ministry. I never got much out of it. Uh, didn't agree with some of the things I said. But anyway, he was showing me through. And uh, he was saying, see, we're 25 miles from the nearest peace officer. And if anybody tried to rob the bank, they'd have to send to Fresno 25 miles away to get either a sheriff or deputy sheriff or policeman or somebody. So they just had to furnish their own protection. Uh, but oh, think of that day when any man can sleep in the wilderness, the uninhabited place, and no one will make him afraid. That's when I'm going to go camping again. <laughs> I've got it through with it for a while. It's got so dangerous. It's got to watch these uninhabited places. Oh, how well we know. How well we know. And so we try to make our own protection. We like to get away from people, but we've got to get among them for a measure of safety, and sometimes that's a measure of danger. We just don't know. Don't know the irony of it. But oh, when a man can sleep in the wilderness. Why? Because the government's right there. It's right with you. You see? Anybody who come try to do you harm, the government take care of me. <laughs> that's the way it is in the kingdom. Now you think that's foolishness? Well, then the government of God is just inadequate. That's all. I don't want any part of it. That's the way it's going to be right here on this earth. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about this earth. In the day when God judges the nations upon the earth. Now, uh, this prayer prophecy principle, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that will be fulfilled in the letter. But there are people who have written to me and say, Mr. Sellers, you are quoting many things that are prayers, and you're quoting them as if they are prophecies. My principle is this, that every prayer becomes a prophecy and will be fulfilled in the letter. You see. Because God caused the Spirit of God to write these things, not just men to say them, but they will be fulfilled the letter. Now let me show you one or two more prayers that are going to be fulfilled of the letter. And here it is in Psalm 9 where he says, verse 19, Arise, O Lord, when the action, O God, let not man prevail. See, man's great desire 919, Psalm 919. Man's great desires prevail over God. Get him out altogether. He has no right to make any laws. He has no right to impose any principles and morality upon us. There is no power above our little brains. And they want to get God out altogether. Schools are set for this. And so on. Uh, the wicked men of earth would make everyone else, beginning with the children, just as wicked as they are. They're afraid to be solitary in their wickedness. And as long as there's one that's not wicked that way, if he just walks the streets and people find it out, he'll condemn them. They've got to get rid of him or make him as wicked as they are. And so they work. And the theater industry is a part of this at the present time. And the television industry is a part of this conspiracy. Uh, so that the wicked man might prevail. It is the, uh, all oh, another place in the Psalms, it gives it in these words, uh, the conspiracy of the workers of iniquity. Let's see, that is Psalm 64. The insurrection of the workers of iniquity. You see, who in 
purge themselves in an evil matter and search out iniquities. You know, there are people who search the world for iniquities. They might bring them back here and display them. Or practice them. To get others to practice them. These are facts. So here the psalmist prays, Quend to action, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before thee. In thy sight means before thee. You judge the nations. I can't settle this matter in Rhodesia. Our government can't. We can't settle this matter of the trouble between Egypt and Israel. You judge the nations. Let the nations be judged before thee. And put them in fear, O Lord. Not to be afraid, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. And right today, we've got a government which seems to think that all the wisdom and all practices and everything should flow right down from Washington. Even to the extent of maybe telling us uh, where, how we should worship. Well, they won't have any trouble with me. They can't stop the kind of worship that I do or tell me how to do it. Now, put them in fear, Lord. They may know themselves to be but men. Here is another prayer. Psalm 10, verse 12. Arise, go into action, O Lord. Lift up your hand. Say, stop. Forget not the heart. Look at uh, verse 15. Break thou the arm, that's the strength of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till you can find them prayer will be answered. So, uh, uh, these prayers, every one of them, and that's what I call the prayer prophecy principle. I could go on to show you many more of them, uh, but uh, remember, every prayer in the Bible is a prophecy, and it will be answered or fulfilled to the very letter. Well, let me give you the last one. I've already dealt with this. This is what we call the N-Apposition Principle. I've already dealt with this, but there's so much truth based upon it that it's the principle of interpretation with me. The Greek word chi, K-A-I, means ang. There's no doubt about that. In English, all we can do with the word and is use it to add something. Uh, I would like a steak and a baked potato. We use and to add the vegetable. And bring me a dish of uh, broccoli. Since I like broccoli, that's why I bring it. All right, we use and to add things. But uh, uh, it would say, bring me a piece of meat and a steak. The waiter would have to say, well, now, what do you mean by that, a piece of meat and a steak? You want some pork, chops and steak, or something? Uh, but we can only use our word and, it seems, to add something, add something. And we can leave it out and put in commas. See, Greeks had no commas. But the Greek word chi could be used to establish definition and fix a thing so that there could be no mistake as to who or what is meant. And they would use this. Now, many places in the New Testament, the Greek word and is translated even because God is establishing a definition. And one of those places is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I've referred to this several times. I do want to give you the location for your notes. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, where it says, uh, He will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, and the Greek word is chi, which means and. But if he says God and the Father, you've got two. God is the Father. So they translate it right here, according to his figure. It is a figure of speech. And it says God, even the Father. And I could show you a lot more places where and is translated even because it wanted to define it. Now, there are many people whose names are Jimmy Carter. Many people. You wouldn't have any trouble finding in your phone book somebody named James Carter. I'm sure. Your New York phone book. 
But if we say James Carter, even the President of the United States, then we define that Jimmy Carter we mean. And there can't be any mistake. Now, the Greeks use this chi to establish this. It's just peculiar to their language. We can't carry it over, but we can watch for it. So, when we find this, especially in in places where it seems to like it's adding things, we'd better watch it. And as I have already said, you uh, would find it in the book of, uh, of uh, Titus. And in Titus, it would read here in the fourth verse, the first chapter, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's two, it seems. You just and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which would give you two sources of grace, mercy, and peace. And that just can't be. You can't say, well, yes, dear, I went to the Father. I won't bother him today. I'll go to the Son. <laughs> but we've got people today who believe that there's things you better go to the Holy Spirit for, and they're making another God. They've created another God, and they've named their God the Holy Spirit. And it's not the Holy Spirit of the Bible. Because when you find the term, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it's the Father, even the Son, even the Holy Spirit. You see, they're the same. They're one. Jehovah our God is one God. Now, you say, but you have a trinity there. You've got to try unity. But these are one. And the Father will do nothing that the Spirit wouldn't do. But we don't pray to the Spirit. How is it that these people have found out all about the Spirit when Jesus Christ said that when the Spirit of truth is come, He won't testify of Himself or speak of Himself He'll take the things of mine and show them to you. They know everything about the Spirit, His blessings, His gifts, and so on. And oh, how they're exalting the Spirit and failing to give Jesus Christ the preeminence. And that's not right. That's not right. But when I see it here in the uh, uh, in, in later verses, and there's so many verses where you will find this, uh, 2.13, there's one there where it says... Uh, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior as if two of them were coming together. No, it is the great God, even our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So watch for that uh, and apposition principle. Watch for it all the time. I have never known a Bible teacher to put any emphasis on this. I've never known a Bible teacher to pay any attention to the prayer prophecy principle. I've never known a man, maybe, could be, that put any emphasis upon the not but our principle. But there's so many things in the Bible where God is calling the things that are not as if they were. As if they were. Well, I'm going to have to stop there. What uh, question now do you want to ask? You turn it into a seminar. You may make comments. I cannot argue with anyone or debate with anyone. But if I can help anyone, I'd like to do so. Brother? Well, yeah, um, like in Revelation 9, it talks about these uh, locusts coming out of the bottomless pit. Could those possibly be demons? Uh, let me say this. There's a tape coming out very soon in which I make a declaration concerning Revelation. You did, I forget. Is that already on the tape? I think it's some early. But a declaration concerning Revelation. Yes, I guess I did. Make that. And this is the gist of that declaration. We're now living in the day of man. Let's get some lines on the board. It began when Noah stepped out of the ark, if I understand it right, it runs through until God assumes sovereignty. And that whole thing is the day of man. And man's day reaches its highest peak in the dispensation of grace. Because before the dispensation of grace, God might strike a wicked man like he did King Herod. Who knows? 
sort of Damocles was kind of over their head, hanging there by a hair, and it could fall. Now next is the day of Christ, that's the kingdom. But the day of the Lord sneaks in like a thief in the night. We can't just set the time that starts because you don't know when the thief's coming. If you knew, you'd be standing there at the door and say, Brother, you're not welcome. But the day of the Lord begins and it takes in the revolt against the kingdom. You see, and it continues uh, through the thousand years of the parousia until God brings in the new heavens and earth, that brings in the day of God. Now we've got the day of man, the day of Christ, the day of God. Whoop, I'm too far ahead. Day of the Lord. Day of God. Now people stumble at this. They said, Mr. Sellers, Christ, Lord, and God, we've just been saying that they're one. All right. Uh, Lyndon Johnson had his day as a congressman. I bet he was quite happy about that when he went up there and took his seat in Congress. Boy, that was his day. But Lyndon Johnson also had his day as vice president. And I think he was probably very happy about that, to be a vice president of the United States. Then he had his day as the president of the United States. Seeing always the same man all the way through. So the word Christ is peculiarly connected with blessing. Messiah. This is the day of Messiah. When Messiah will have his day with Israel, with mankind, with the nations, with the world. This is called the day of the Lord, Jehovah, because it is especially connected with the great revelation that will take place. It seems like that when Satan knows that this is going to take place, that that's why he stirs up this revolt against the kingdom. And since the Lord has removed the restraints, why it takes place. And of course, the day of God looks forward to the new heavens, and all of these are scriptural terms, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. Now, uh, this is many centuries in length. and the book of Revelation, in its entirety, John was carried forward uh, and he found himself in the Lord's day, which would be the Greek way of saying the day of the Lord. It wasn't Sunday, as everyone says. It was the day of the Lord, and he saw those things. And everything in the book of Revelation has nothing to do with the present time. It has nothing to do with this. It has to do with the day of the Lord. Now, I don't think I'm quite ready for the knowledge of this, is what these locusts are that come forth. I think that there's a divine idiom there in many places. I certainly can't tell anyone what it means when it says that a certain number of men were killed and the blood of these men came up to the horses' bridles. Uh, if you take all the men on the world at one time, take all their blood, you couldn't cover that space. It says the horses' bits is really the word, not bridle. But whatever it is, it had to be very deep to come up to the horses' bridles. I don't know what that means, but I don't need to know because I've got all this time to learn about it, and I'll even talk to John about it. And if John can't do it, then I'll go right to God and say, Lord, I've got to have information. Because when we get up here, where this thing is upon us, we've got to have complete information. <coughs> so we'll know just what to do and how to act, know how to behave ourselves. So we'll have it, but not now, because I'm not up there. I'm not up there. So as the Lord said, don't take too much thought for tomorrow because sufficient for this day is enough worry. That puts enough worry on you. And so we've got a lot to think about of this and that which is maybe upon us before I'll see you again, who knows. But this is way off. And this is still so far ahead that God doesn't tell it, God tells us next to nothing about this except that God will be dwelling with man. Brother. Uh, brother uh in this dispensation of the grace of God, yes, uh, in secret now, could God heal a person if he wanted? Oh, absolutely, he does. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, sir. No doubt about it. God in grace yeah. could heal a person. Okay. Uh, 
I went through a very distressing experience in which one day after I got back from a 10 weeks trip, Mr. Sellers was with me that time, uh, my gallbladder was at the point of bursting and uh, the stone had cut off circulation and gangrene had set in. And it was so bad the doctors could not take it out. It just simply told me after, he said, you're like a man all puffed up with poison ivy. His features are all gone. You can't recognize it. And after it was all over with, they were going to discharge me. My doctor came in and said, I'm glad you're still with us. I'll tell you personally, I never thought you would be. But yet, I'm glad you're still alive. He said, uh, I can't say that we really did anything great for you. We did take the stones out. We did uh, drain you and clear up all this infection. But it's, I want to give you credit, he said, for your complete cooperation and your, uh, your uh, patience and uh, your determination that you were going to get well. He said, that's what did it. I said, now, now don't forget, Doc, the power of the body to heal itself and the prayers of God's people and my own prayers. Well, he doesn't pay much attention to that. <laughs> but uh, as doctors don't seem to consider that. But uh, we always do. You see, if anything goes wrong with me, I've got uh, three things working for me. I'll just number them. I'll just list them, but I'll not give them their part. Number one is the power that God built into my body. That uh, power that is there uh, to heal itself. You, you see it when you scratch your hand and the whole body goes in action. You don't know anything about it. But blood cells are rushing there and laying down their life uh, to be flesh, to heal that scratch. You don't know it, but it's healed. Now, God did that. But that's a process that he established when he created the human body. But that can work even to cure cancer. Who knows? It could. Now, uh, the second thing I like is a good doctor that I can trust. A man in whom I have confidence. Who will explain everything to me, tell me what he's doing, and give it to me in terms that I can understand. Don't keep anything from me. But... Most of all is the miracle that might be needed, that would be in secret. Now, I can't prove it. I had the best of medical care. Doctors put themselves out for uh, time and everything, some of it without charge, but they did. Uh, but I had all of that, and that's what an atheist would say did it. There's good medical care, this fine hospital, and so on. No, I've got to give the glory to God. But I'll have to wait till I get over here and can trace out the grace to know what God... In the meantime, I'll thank Him. And if I should ever thank God for something He didn't do, I'm way behind on my Thanksgiving anyway. So uh, I'll just count that as part of it. So, uh, even so, Epaphroditus in Philippians was healed. Yes. And uh, But it took time, took the healing process, took the prayers of Paul... And that's what we want. Give it time. You know, Oral Roberts went around healing everybody. <laughs> He's finally decided that you ought to have a hospital where you had the healing arts to prayer. Well, I knew that all the time. I can told him that all the time ago. I didn't have to go out in the desert and get a revelation from God about this, as he says he did. I'm sure you want the healing arts. They've got them. Well, we're getting around here toward 4 o'clock. Wait, that broadcast comes around 4.30. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stick around. I'll like stick around. Who wants speech can? Here, help us out. Pass it off. Okay, now, what other question? I, I missed some. Um, Did I get the offering? Hey, the red. You can help. Great, great, great.